Welcome back, A Push Peeps. We have video number nine for you. This one will focus on the First Great Awakening, Anglicization, that's an important word to know, and the Enlightenment. Before we begin, it's shout out time to Mrs. Payne's class in Louisiana. Thank you for watching. Best of luck this year. You are brilliant and will do great. So let's start talking about pluralism. And what pluralism is, is multiple groups living together. And keep in mind during this time, you have many people from different continents coming to America and living in the 13 colonies. People from many European countries and regions came to the English colonies, especially the middle colonies. Think of Pennsylvania and William Penn pictured here. And people from different religious backgrounds are coming here as well. And with them, we have intellectual exchanges from different European groups. Okay, the first great awakening was a religious revival in England and the 13 colonies. It's important to know this occurred in England as well. It is a focus on the individual. Some key people you should know. The first dude, you should definitely know, Jonathan Edwards. He started the Great Awakening. If you're following along with the Enhanced Video Guide, you'll actually be able to look at one of his sermons, an excerpt from one of his sermons, Famous Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Next, we have John Wesley over here who helped found Methodism. And if you know Wesleyan Church, that was founded after this dude, John Wesley. And the last guy down there is George Whitfield. He was a great orator from England. He came here to the Americas from England and preached about religion. And this is an example of something called transatlantic exchanges or ideas being spread from Europe to America. Okay, so what are the impacts of the First Great Awakening? Well, we have new branches of Christianity that emerged. Groups like Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians. Again, John Wesleyan and the Methodists formed during this time. There's a rejection of authority. So there's a challenge to traditional religious authority. And this is going to help inspire rejection of British authority in the 1760s and 1770s. So if you're writing an essay about the American Revolution, definitely go back to this idea of challenging authority from the First Great Awakening helped inspire people to challenge authority in the 1760s and 1770s, which we'll talk about in a couple videos from now. So let's jump over to the Enlightenment. This is the time of questioning of government and divine authority. So you have people like John Locke who believed in natural rights, life, liberty, and property. Montesquieu believed in separation of powers. If you ever forget that, count out hit the syllables in his name. Montesquieu, there's three, separation of powers, think three branches. Voltaire believed in freedom of religion and speech. That will go on to influence the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, part of the Bill of Rights. Now, Anglicization. This is a term that means the that America is basically using more British norms and customs or acting like Britain. And this makes sense. There's a lot of contact between the 13 colonies and Britain. So the colonies are going to behave and act and use a lot of British customs and norms. So how were the colonies anglicized or how did they become like Great Britain? Well, colonial governments were based on English models. Transatlantic print culture, this is the idea of ideas and goods being spread via trade and newspapers. So a lot of British newspapers would be read in the Americas. And Protestant evangelicalism. Again, we have George Whitfield here. He came from England to America to spread his message. That's an example of transatlantic exchanges that we just talked about a moment ago. Now, mercantilism and imperial aims. Definitely no mercantilism. This is the idea that the colonies exist for making money for the mother country. The sole purpose of the 13 colonies is for Britain to make money off of them and gain profit. So Britain wanted an imperial structure that was coherent and hierarchical with them on top. And the colonies would be subordinate to Great Britain. An example of this is the Navigation Acts where the colonies could only trade with Great Britain. However, conflicts with colonists and natives did emerge during this time, specifically as the colonists wanted to expand out west. So Britain is going to seek to limit this expansion, especially post Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, to avoid conflict with natives. We'll talk about that more in video 11 or 12. I can't remember which one. So colonial resistance to imperial control, the colonists are going to resist this imperial structure. Um, it occurred because of colonial self-government. Certain colonists could vote for representatives, but they had no say in Parliament. So they had say, a say in colonial laws, but they didn't in English or British laws. 
There are also ideas of liberties. Colonists saw themselves as British and wanted the same rights as those that were born and lived in Britain. The Enlightenment, I can't overstate how influential this was. This is the challenging traditional ideas of government. Religious independence and diversity is another reason. There's less of a focus on the Anglican Church, and this led to challenging authority in other areas. Again, in the 1760s and 1770s, people are going to begin to challenge the government. There's perceived corruption in the imperial system. People like Sir Edmund Andros of the Dominion of New England, he eliminated colonial assemblies, and he was seen as a corrupt government official, and he will eventually be overthrown. All right, let's do a quick recap. Pluralism, know what it is. Impacts of the First Great Awakening, absolutely connect that bad boy to the American Revolution. Be able to identify and explain two key people from the Great Awakening. Enlightenment and two people as well know them, especially John Locke. Anglicization, what is it and how were the colonies anglicized or how did they become anglicized? That's a horribly worded question. Sorry about that. What is mercantilism and why did colonists resist imperial control? All right, look forward to seeing you back here for video number 10, Slavery in the British Colonies and Slave Resistance. Thank you for watching. Best of luck on all of your exams and have a good day.